those feathers in the sky. Yeah. And I got to thinking, and I was okay. smiling because how beautiful. And Bernice, yeah. uh, you know, that was an inspiration because there will be ghost riders. <clears throat> like the days of Noah. During his teachings in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, which has uh, come to be called the Olivet Discourse, Yeshua compares the days leading up to his return to Noah's time. And here's what he says. In Matthew 24 verse 37, For as were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man. So the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah. So what does that mean? Well, we know that in the first century, the story of Noah's flood was a common analogy for Yahweh's final judgment. Peter makes the same comparison in, in his second epistle. Second Peter 2 verse 5, Yahweh didn't spare the ancient world either. He brought the flood on the world of ungodly people, but he protected Noah and the seven other people. Noah was his messenger who told people about the kind of life that Yahweh has approved of. In 2 Peter 3 verse 6 and 7, water also flooded and destroyed the world. By Yahweh's word, the present heaven and earth are designated to be burned. They are being kept until the day ungodly people will be judged and destroyed. This theme is also found in Second Temple Jewish literature outside the Bible, like the Book of Enoch. So it shouldn't be surprising that Yeshua used this ready metaphor to speak of the coming judgment. But what was his point in making this comparison? How are the days of Noah illustrative of the coming of the Son of Man? Well, as with anything regarding biblical prophecy and the end days, there has been a lot of speculation. Some say that just as Noah's time was marked by extreme wickedness, so too will the end days be a time of wickedness and depravity. Often people will cite examples of increasing evil and abandonment of morality happening in America and around the world to suggest that we're drawing near to the end. Others say that just as a great act of judgment marked Noah's time, that is the flood, so too will the last days be marked by great acts of judgment. Often people will point to natural disasters happening around the world to suggest that our current generation must be the last. Still others go so far as to say Yeshua's use of this analogy implies that fallen angels and the mysterious Nephilim will reappear in the last days. And I'm reading a book called The Corrupting of the Image which talks just about that. According to the common interpretation of Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4, many believe the Nephilim to be the offspring of fallen angels and human women. Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4. The number of people increased over all the earth. The daughters were born to them. The sons of Elohim saw that the daughters of other humans were beautiful. So they married any woman they chose. Then Yeshua said, My spirit will not struggle with humans forever, because they are flesh and blood. They will live 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days as well as later, when the sons of Elohim slept with the daughters of other humans and had children by them. These children were famous long ago. The book of Enoch speaks about fallen angels in Noah's day who taught humans about magic and weapons and led mankind into violence and promised unity. Because of that, some speculate that in the end days the fallen angels will reappear. Perhaps they will be perceived as aliens from outer space. And they will lead mankind into all sorts of wickedness again. Moreover, since the Nephilim were apparently the result of an unauthorized mixture of seed, that is, fallen angels and humans, 
we should expect to see something like this again as we draw near to the end. Often people will point to genetic experiments involving hybrid creatures as evidence that we are part of the final generation. While it is certainly tempting to go down these roads of speculation, we don't need to. The key to understanding what Yeshua meant by this statement is to read the passage carefully, along with the following passages which make his point clear. Now this isn't to say that there is no validity, validity to the, uh, some of these parallels given to, in Noah's day and the final generation. It certainly can't be denied that lawlessness will increase significantly before the time of the end. Obviously, the end days will involve judgment, but Yeshua used this analogy to Noah's flood to make a different point. It is the first of a few examples Yeshua gives to demonstrate what he says a verse earlier. However, before we get there, let's establish the overall context. Yeshua's Olivet Discourse is his teaching in response to the disciples' questions in Matthew 24, verse 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of age? Yeshua had just finished prophesying of the destruction of the temple. In Matthew 24, verse 2, Yeshua said to them, You see all these buildings, don't you? I can guarantee this truth. Not one of these stones will be left on top of another. Each one will be torn down. So the first question regarding these things focuses on the destruction of the temple. But their second question focuses on the sign of the second coming and the end of the age. Yeshua's teaching throughout Matthew 24 refers to Jerusalem's destruction as well as the last days and his second coming, but not in some strict chronological order. The destruction of the temple is given as a prophetic foreshadowing of the final tribulation to come. While Yeshua doesn't directly answer his disciples' question regarding when these things will occur, he does give warning about what to look out for. These warnings were certainly relevant to the generation of Yeshua's day, especially in light of the destruction of Jerusalem in their time. But these warnings are also relevant to every generation after us as, he draw, as we draw near to the end of the age. In response to his disciples' questions, Yeshua warned about false prophets leading people astray, wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, persecution, lawlessness, and so forth. Afterwards, finally, the Son of Man will come on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. But then Yeshua makes this statement in verse 36, just prior to his comparisons to Noah's flood. In Matthew 24, verse 36, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Yeshua's point here is pretty straightforward. Nobody can predict his coming because nobody but the Father knows when it will be. So, any attempt at calculating a definitive date for the second coming is ultimately futile. We simply can't know. In light of Yeshua's statement in verse 36, the signs he gives previously in this chapter are not meant to provide some timetable so that we can set dates and predict the timing of the end times. Instead, the point is to prompt us to be alert and watchful at all times so that when certain signs do occur, we will recognize them. The rest of Yeshua's Olivet Discourse makes this clear. So now we get to the Yeshua's comparison to Noah's flood. In Matthew 24, verse 37 to 39, for as were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man. 
For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. <coughs> what does Yeshua mean when he says the people of Noah's day were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage? He's saying that people were simply living their daily lives. They went about their regular business, completely unaware that the flood was about to come and sweep them away. The point is this. In the same way, the masses will be caught by surprise in the end days. They will be living their lives unaware that judgment is at hand. Again, while there is no reason to doubt that lawlessness will increase in the end days, that's not Yeshua's point here. After all, there's nothing sinful about eating and drinking and marrying. These are activities of ordinary life. Matthew 24, verse 40 to 42. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Again, we see here that people will be going about their normal lives and that the coming of the Lord will be unexpected. Therefore, followers of Yeshua must stay awake. That's you and I. This is translated to watch in most other translations, and it brings up the image of a night watchman at his post. Yeshua's followers are to be prepared for his coming, watching for it. Yeshua continues with another example in Matthew 24, 43 and 44. But know this that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, also you must be, re you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Once again, the point is straightforward. The timing of Yeshua's coming is unknown. Therefore, we must always be ready. She goes on to give a parable, comparing the time leading up to the second coming to a servant watching over his master's house. Matthew 24, verse 45 through 51. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Once again, this parable contributes to Yeshua's overall point. He will come when the wicked don't expect him. Therefore, we must not be like the wicked servant, but like the faithful and wise servant. This parable also further defines what be alert looks like. We must be doing the work that our master called us to do. We must serve our master faithfully by observing his commandments and serving others. We must not have the mindset of thinking that we can get away with evil because we believe the Messiah won't be returning anytime soon. Instead, we should always be about our master's work. From here, Yeshua gives a parable of the ten bridesmaids awaiting a bridegroom. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. When the end comes, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids. They took their oil lamps and went to meet the groom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. The foolish bridesmaid took the lamps, but they didn't take any extra oil. The wise bridesmaid 
however, took along extra oil for their lamps. Since the groom was late, all the bridesmaids became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, someone shouted, the groom is here, come to meet him. Then all the bridesmaids woke up and got their lamps ready. The foolish ones said to the wise ones, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. But the wise bridesmaid replied, we can't do that. There won't be enough for both of us. Go find some, someone to sell you some oil. And while they were buying, buying oil, the groom arrived. The bridesmaid who were ready went with him into the wedding hall and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaid arrived and said, Sir, sir, open the door for us. But he answered them, I don't even know you. So stay awake, because you don't know the day or the hour. It's the same message. The timing of Yeshua's second coming is unknown. Therefore, be watchful. Don't be like the foolish bridesmaid who didn't have enough oil in their lamps. The next parable concerns the industrious servants versus the slothful servant. Matthew 25, 14 through 30. And the kingdom of heaven is like a man going on a trip. He called his servants and entrusted some money to them. He gave one man $10,000, another $4,000, and another $2,000. Each was given money based on his ability. Then the man went on his trip. The one who received $10,000 invested the money at once and doubled his money. The one that had $4,000 did the same and also doubled his money. But the one who received $2,000 went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The one who received $10,000 bought the additional $10,000. He said, sir, you gave me $10,000. I've doubled the amount. His master replied, good job. You're a good and faithful servant. You proved that you could be trusted with a small amount. I will put you in charge of a large amount. Come and share your master's happiness. The one who received $4,000 came and said, sir, you gave me $4,000. I have doubled the amount. His master replied, good job. You're a good and trust, faithful servant. You proved that you could be trusted with a small amount. I will put you in charge of a large amount. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the one who received $2,000 came and said, Sir, I knew that you were a hard person to please. You harvest where you haven't planted and gathered where you haven't scattered any seeds. I was afraid, so I hid your $2,000 in the ground. Here's your money. His master responded, you evil and lazy servant. If you knew that I harvested where I haven't planted and gathered where I haven't scattered, then you should have invested my money with the bankers. When I return, I would have received my money back with interest. Take the $2,000 away from him. Give it to the one that has $10,000. To all who have, more will be given and they will have more than enough, but everything will be taken away from those who don't have much. Throw this useless servant outside into the darkness. People will cry and be in extreme pain there. A man goes on a journey and will return at a unknown time. In the meantime, he entrusts a portion of his money to three servants. Upon his return, the master blesses the servants who wisely invested the money, given them an end, and condemns the servant who, out of fear, buried his portion. This goes back to the idea that readiness for Messiah's return demands faithfulness to the work he called us to do. Finally, Yeshua concludes his teaching with a warning of the final judgment. Matthew 25, Verse 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels are with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. The people of every nation will be gathered in front of him. He will separate them as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. 
He will put the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, my father has blessed you, inherit the kingdom, prepared for you from the creation of the world. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me into your home. I needed clothes, and you gave me something to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the people who have Yahweh's approval will reply to him, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you into our home, or see you in need of clothes and gave you something to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will answer them, I can guarantee this truth. Whatsoever you did for one of my brothers or sisters, no matter how unimportant they seemed, you did it for me. Then the king will say to those on his left, Get away from me. Yahweh has cursed you. Go into everlasting fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me into your home. I needed clothes and you didn't give me anything to wear. I was sick and in prison and you didn't take care of me. They too will ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or as a stranger or in need of clothes or sick or in prison and didn't help you? He will answer them, I can guarantee this truth. Whatsoever you fail to do for one of my brothers or sisters, no matter how unimportant they seemed, you failed to do for me. These people will go away into eternal punishment, but those with God's approval will go into eternal life. Yeshua will reign as king and separate the sheep from the goats. Those who cared for the least of these, that is, the hungry, the stranger, the naked, sick, or imprisoned will inherit the kingdom. Those who neglected to care for the least of these will be condemned. Therefore, we must be ready and watchful, always serving our master by serving our neighbor. Truly, I say to you, as you did to the one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Peter reinforces Yahweh, Yeshua's teaching in his second epistle, in which he also appeals to in Noah's flood. Second Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. Dear friends, this is the second letter I'm writing to you. In both letters, I'm trying to refresh your memory. I want you to remember the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets, and that what the Lord and Savior commanded you through his apostles. First, you must understand this. In the last days, people who follow their own desires will appear. These disrespectful people will ridicule Yahweh's promise by saying, what's happened to his promise to return? Ever since our ancestors died, everything continues as it did from the beginning of the world. They are deliberately ignoring one fact. Because of Yahweh's word, Heaven and earth existed a long time ago. The earth appeared out of the water and was kept alive by the water. Water also flooded and destroyed that world. By Yahweh's word, the present heaven and earth are designated to be burned. They are being kept until the day ungodly people will be judged and destroyed. He says that scoffers will mock the idea of the second coming. Second Peter 3 verse 4. They say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. In the end days, people will deny the very reality of the end days. They will disregard Yeshua's warning and continue living as if there is no coming come judgment. In their view, everything seems to be the same as it always been. So what's the point in serving Yahweh? 
but to them the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly like a thief. Second Peter 3 verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, heaven will pass away with a warring sound. Everything that makes up the universe will burn and be destroyed. The earth and everything that people have done on it will be exposed. And since they refuse to believe the Gospels and live in accordance with Scripture, like the people in Noah's day, they will be swept away in Yahweh's final judgment. So what lesson do we learn from these passages? First, as Yeshua teaches us, we are to be alert and watchful at all times. As Peter warns us, we are not to be like the scoffers who deludes himself into thinking there will be no consequences for his action. Instead, we are to live our lives in accordance with the knowledge that we are accountable to Yahweh for how we live. We are to spend our time doing the work our master gives us to do. And as Peter puts, puts it in 2 Peter 3 verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. And second, we must not become discouraged as we await the arrival of our king. Just as the bridegroom was delayed, in Matthew 25, verse 5, since the groom was late, all the bridesmaids became drowsy and fell asleep. Messiah's second coming might be delayed from our perspective as well. But there is a purpose in waiting. Peter says in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should be reach repentance. Yahweh has given us time to repent because he desires that nobody should perish. Likewise, we ought to have the same concern for others. Just as Yahweh's heart is for the unbeliever, we should desire that all reach repentance. Proclaiming the gospel of our king is to be a top priority. Our Messiah's end time message, echoed by the Apostle Peter, is meant to inspire us to take action in the midst of those around us who are just going about their regular lives, completely unaware of what's to come. We ought to be mindful of the reality of Yahweh's judgment. We ought to be focused on living holy lives and sharing the gospel with all who will listen. Now, while some believers don't take seriously the warnings to be watchful, others misinterpret what that means and miss the point of the warnings. It's a sad fact that many believers who take an interest in studying the end days seems to neglect the things they are called to do with the information. People's interest in the end days often leads to things like predictions of the future and date setting. Even though Yeshua said no one besides the Father knows the timing. Also, rather than producing a sense of urgency to reach the lost, many end time studies lead people to obsess over their speculations about aliens and microchips and other such things. It's all they want to focus on. And while being prepared for emergency is a good idea, a lot of people also become obsessed with doomsday prepping and survivalism to such a degree that they isolate themselves from the world, failing to be the light that people need to see. As we discovered, the Messiah's admonishment to be watchful entails faithful service to Yahweh and our neighbor. That's what we need to be focused on. Being ready does not mean stockpiling food and weapons in, in the mountains. Being ready means that we are completely sold out to Yeshua and ready to testify for him no matter what our situation. It means that we are ready to suffer for Yeshua in the short term because we realize that we will live forever with him 
in his presence. It means that we will not take a mark of loyalty to the beast, whether that is figurative or literal, because we belong to a different master, the Lamb. The coming of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, draws near. We, as his disciples, ought to live our lives accordingly. May we be encouraged to stay awake and live holy lives, desiring to bring the lost to repentance for Yahweh's glory. Stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Yahweh bless.